if it, one of my assignments was the math stuff on the Excel spreadsheets. I mm -hmm. had no idea. Oh my God, what fun. Yeah. Okay. Recording wow. is on. Okay. Wow. So yeah. you're recording. So yeah, why don't you hit like, make sure that when you um, leave the meeting that you actually hit stop, otherwise you lose it. You know what I mean? Yeah. It'll just fact, go on for it. Well, let's see. Can I do open, share, stop recording? Yeah, yeah, okay. Recording, only one person can record at a time. Okay, Jan, just you and me and the rest of the world. So welcome to, oh, ahead, welcome to our Tuesday, October 16, 2018 meeting at 2 p.m. Central Time, our normal meeting time for the development team. So if you look at the, first of all, take a look at the, the development uh the working document if you're not on there already so so you can actually find it if you if you're familiar with the wiki open source ecology.org wiki and the the page is called current meeting so you can find that and the link is in the chat box for everyone on the team here so abe welcome um let's let's start with just a little review of where we're at so actually as far as the overall effort of open source ecology where we are expanding after the immersion program so you do see a nice bubble here starting about august end of august so september re reflects the work during the immersion program with our full-time people then continuing after that we're we're kind of around the 250 hour per week quota which is actually, if you convert that to full-time equivalent, that would be about five or six people full-time equivalent. So that's that's good. Um, we have Alex and Sarah in California working full-time on setting up operations in California. And then Dixon is in Utah. He's spending about, uh, Dixon used to be on a dev team here. He's spending about 60% uh, or so of his time. Uh, his current project is actually focusing on, on the, um, uh, the laser cutter which is once again D3D laser cutter, which means we are using the same universal axis system and just putting simply a, a laser head on it. So actually I talked to David Lee, who's an open source advocate, advocate from China. He said that we should reframe the universal axis to really like robotics construction set because you can scale it and then you can put whatever head you like on it or you configure it. Therefore it becomes uh, a construction set for automation or robotics he likes to say he actually mentioned that we could with it we could probably do a super low cost version of the farm bot which is quite expensive right now but with our technique we can definitely uh, drive uh, that price down if those blueprints are fully available so uh, good news on a team I mean we're slowly but surely increasing and of course the next immersion is gonna be in April May and we look forward to that we're gonna get into the heavy machine starting with the CNC torch table which is derived from 3D printed parts. So that's that's why the open source micro factory, the desktop version is important for the much larger picture because we're, we're definitely putting on a map the idea of using one inch rods and two inch and even three inch rods for super stiff machines using the same universal access system. So uh, on page two of the, uh, the meeting doc there, let me share my screen so everyone can see that. Uh, on page two, uh, we've got a picture of our team. We, t we took a little photo shoot when everyone was here a few weeks ago for, for the website. And thanks. So Alex, Sarah, and Dixon on the left, Jesus there, and me with a hat. Uh, and then we're, uh, I don't know if you've seen, microfactory.opensourceecology.org. So that's our new website, uh, primarily for the California operations. But it's, no, it's the microfactory in general, but... A lot of that work, if you look at, uh, if you click on that and see upcoming events, that's, they're happening in the Bay Area of San Francisco. So if you uh, see that, uh, if you're in the San Francisco Bay Area, there's workshops around you on the 3D printer right now. And uh, we're, so as far as our team is, is concerned, you know, Alex and Sarah learned to trade. They can build the printer inside out uh, and pretty much troubleshoot just about most of it. And uh, we're starting very slowly, so we're going to Hacker Spaces Public Library. So our first event is going to be at actually in. Um, so look at the workshop interest form. The first event is going to be. That's a link on the wiki. Uh, we're hosting the first one at Counterculture Lab, a hacker space on biohacking. And actually, a friend there, Anthony, 
he's working on open source insulin, so that's actually a very valuable project, but we're holding our first first workshop on October 27th at Counterculture Labs. And then the second one that's already secured is November 10 at the San Francisco Public Library. Get a load of that. Uh, in San Francisco, so the first one's in Ber in uh, Oakland, the second one in San Francisco, and around the areas where we're moving around to. And we're kind of framing it, you know, starting slowly, so uh, we're aiming for just a gradual ramp up as we gain the experience with Alex and Sarah working independently. So just only like two builds uh, for the first event, then two builds, four builds, and building up to six builds so that Alex and Sarah get really comfortable doing that and we can really deliver a high quality experience. I think we've got the technology nailed. I mean, we really spent a lot of intense time on that during the immersion program where starting with the bad, bad start on uh, the materials sourcing, we were working out a lot of different issues throughout to, to the point that we ended up with the the Titan Aero Extruder, which is a really high quality one, one of the best ones out there. Um, so that's the current iteration. The the main improvements uh, to at this point to the 3D printer are that we have uh, the LCD screen, we've got the Titan Aero Extruder, and on the code front, actually one of the last minute developments there was real time adjustment of the first layer so that when you're printing the first layer, you've got your Z offset that you have to set to calibrate. But if it's not sticking properly, you can adjust the first layer ever so slightly. So you get the perfect sticking to the first uh, of the first layer. So that's actually a very, very useful feature. Uh, I was basically turning that on within Marlin firmware. It's, it's already in there. It's all, it's all in there. It's all in Marlin. We just had to turn it on. Didn't even know it was available already in Cura. So that's it uh, on and that ramping up slowly but surely in a California place and also uh, really trying to work out so we've got working on venue selection protocol now working on the marketing protocol so we can actually populate workshops and then I'll be getting on to uh, developing the product of the two-day teachers training or librarian and teacher training such that uh, it's, a, it's a continuing education thing where you the, the teachers and librarians get continuing ed education as well as a, a 3D printer for their library or school. So we're doing market research on that and stuff like that. Uh, the full bill of materials is online. So if you look at D3D or, or 3D printer bill of materials, the current cost actually stands at $483 when you include the Titan Aero Extruder, which is $108 in itself. So it's extruder is rather expensive, the most expensive single part. Um, now, I did draw up a simple 3D printer BOM on the wiki as well, which you can look at. And that total for stripped down version without heat bed, six, but including a six inch bed, is only $250. So that's actually much lower cost. Uh, so I do notice we have Sarah on the team. Sarah, you, want, you mind telling us a, a word or two of what you're up to right now, just so everybody's involved, uh, you know, kind of gets a, gets a feeling for what we're all doing? Hi, sure. Um, yeah, earlier this week I've been focusing on um, the marketing effort where we've been finding venues and um, posting our Oakland event, which is already scheduled and secured at a venue. We've been posting that to event calendars, trying to get the word out um, about it, sending press releases, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and now, like today specifically, I am focusing on updating the Microfactory website and putting together some Facebook posts. We are going to the East Bay Maker Fair. Open Source Ecology will have a booth there that we're really excited about. Nice. Um, Alex and I, at some point, realized we were like, oh, we aren't actually people who identify as makers or, or like want to be makers like that's why we got into open source ecology because we want to become that not because we already are that so um mm -hmm. we feel yeah. it's really important for us to engage with that community and just start talking to people and so that's our kind of primary goal at the maker fair is to do that and to promote the upcoming workshop in oakland there 
Will we even have our own open source Ecology 3D printing setup up there printing parts? Of course we will. All right. I knew that. That's good. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Any questions from Sarah, Jen, or Abe, like, uh, since Sarah's online and she's, uh, she can tell you a lot of things. Jen's already blowing up the chat because she's, like, knowing that I owe her some social media posts. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. And, and then we're looking at, yes, yeah, as far as Google Ads, we, we do have a ton of um, Google Ad I mean, we have access to that through open source ecology. Uh, so Sarah, like what's a summary on a Google ads? I mean, is, do we have promise? Like we can, we can get nice ads out there that someone clicks on and says, Hey, build your own 3d printer. Like, do you think that's going to work? Or that's like, are we having faith in that or? Yeah. The update on Google ads is we are currently running ads on keywords like build your own 3d printer, 3d printer workshops. Um, mm-hmm at a very kind of juvenile level we're doing that um but we have a lot of potential there we have a nonprofit grant that gives us up to ten thousand dollars a month which is basically unlimited amount of ads um so we're sourcing our keywords by um yeah i did like a basic keyword analysis using the seo tool that google has um Mm -hmm. but Primarily, we're very specific, so we're really just focusing on exactly what we're offering, which is a 3D printer build, um, build your own kind of deal. So, yeah, like, hopefully we'll just find someone who identifies as a Google ad hawk, and they'll just really want to take over managing our campaigns there, because we have a, a lot of potential. How did you say you're, you're sourcing your keywords? So Google provides a tool that you put in a keyword and they tell you how many searches it gets per month. Mm. So generally the workflow there is to have keywords that are actually searched for rather than keywords that are never searched for. Oh, wow. Like build your own 3D printer on a pterodactyl would probably not be a good keyword to use. Yeah. Yeah. No one does that. Jen, how can you help with SEO? (laughs) search engine optimization um I'd, I'd have to get into it but it, that's what i was doing for try it's more like a grok thing so um you, you need a you need a lot of chatter and you need to the keywords are like a really big deal and you need to coordinate the different well not you um we need to coordinate the different medias because facebook's great but we can we can get a lot of traffic to articles on facebook to our open source um, ecology page on facebook through we need Instagram posts, we need Twitter posts, and the problem with I mean the, not the problem the thing with all of that is that things have to be formatted differently on each of the different social medias, and that's something that I already have experience with. I already have a grok up, and I appreciate and enjoy doing. So I mean yeah, yeah you're, I mean if if you're into like differentiating all those different social media, but I'm not picking up that that's what you're putting down, then you fly right at it because I don't really have time but I would love to do this. And this is something that I've done before. And it's something that I enjoy doing. Okay. Yeah. The OSB Instagram, I think needs to materialize. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so, and I need, so I need, I need access to the, um, to the OSC Twitter so that I can post Twitter and like, we can get, we can get traffic directed to Facebook through Twitter and through um, Instagram. I don't have a lot of Instagram followers right now, but I have a fair number of Twitter followers and um, I'm hitting a lot. I'm hitting a lot of um, independent community type people. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it, it, it just occurred to me yesterday, listening to a couple of podcasters. Like anybody interested in space is going to be interested in this because they're going to the, the 3D printer is just fundamental to any kind of off planet um, off planet civilization. It's it's just it's just essential to it. It's fundamental. That's that's what it's about. Is being able to make your own stuff and recycle indefinitely. So anybody interested in space is going to be interested in this. And that's just like more than half the population almost at this point. Where are we going? I'm just, a, a lot of marketing ideas hit me last night. And and so I'll quit, I'll quit clogging up the developers meeting with it. But Sarah, we need to talk. I, I've got a lot of ideas. Cool. Um, so, yeah, we could set you up to the OSC Twitter and Instagram. Now, there's a page called 3D Printer Graphics Assets on the wiki. So you can click on all those things like the photo shoot, 
um, some flyers. Uh, there's graphics guidelines. Excellent. Um, 3D printer infographics. So just a few things that you can use and feel free to do that. Um, Sarah, where, where are we keeping like all the graphics? Otherwise, there's yeah. I mean, I'm putting all everything related to the printer on this wiki page. So also continue to do that. But yeah, some of those are links to our photo shoots. Yeah. Yep, so that's good. Okay, excellent. So yeah, we'll, we'll keep going on that. And it's really about like, if we think about marketing strategy, the funnel there. Um, yeah, I'm trying to, to work on that. But, but yeah, it's like, how does one thing feed into the other? So maybe we can like go over that next week. Um, maybe like do a little chart. I'll, I'll, I'll start one. But there's a lot of different ways we can cross talk and cross feed from one to the next. So I'm work, actually working on, on kind of like an infographic for that, kind of like the flow chart, because uh, there is a whole range of things we can be doing. Uh, so that's that's pretty good. Like including, and I'll I'll, I'll go to this uh, just the workshop interest form. If you click on it, that's on the wiki already. We've got like whatever, like ten. I just posted this up like a couple of days ago, but that's actually a great thing to do. Like um, asking people, okay, are you interested in a workshop? Let's get people. If there's enough people on a map in a certain location. We can actually travel there and actually host a workshop, so that's a that's a good thing. But it can feed into our, you know, we can spread this on our, put this on our website, which is already is. I saw Sarah, you already put that on there. We can put it on. I'll, I'll you know, we can repost this on the OSA Workshops Facebook page, the main main Facebook and other places, so we keep generating interest. Yeah, I, I would I would put that on heavy rotation. I mean, if you don't want it on your Twitter, I would put that in heavy rotation on my Twitter, and I would put that I. I would consider that appropriate for my LinkedIn as well. Yeah, yeah. So there's. You know, I'm not picky about my LinkedIn, but I would definitely consider OSC stuff is definitely appropriate for my LinkedIn. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. We just got to just post the snot out of this stuff until people <laughs> are like getting into it. It's fine. It's cool. It's like it, this is this is absolutely the coolest thing on the planet right now, and it, it might even be the coolest thing off planet. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a this is a thing, Martin. We are going up against. Whoa. This is a thing. Uh huh. What this is, is this is. Yeah. This is gonna. This is saving the world. This is this is what's preventing the big corporations from taking over. Is is you're giving power back to the people. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean. I that's it, it. You know. I mean, we don't have we don't have to seize the means of production. We are the means of production, right. and this is proving it. it this right, is so yeah. important. Yeah, it's important that people recognize that we are the we are production and so forth. Yeah. So let's let's continue on that. So thanks, Sarah and. Abe, do you have any updates uh, regarding the power cube? Because actually, you know, Abe, there's uh, just for bigger context. Um, I did get contacted by, by a fellow who's working in Africa, and they want to do a actually a micro track pilot. So I actually need to spend a day this week, like an evening, uh, writing up that proposal. But there's a wiki page started that's called Africa Pilot, I believe, and it starts laying out what we could do with a micro track, but the power cube is a big component of that, so if that goes through, uh, you might be getting invited to to Africa. But yeah, if that goes through, that'll be interesting. But it's a, it, I mean, the cool thing for me, it's like, okay, n you know, we don't want to imperialize Africa, but the idea here is that we are teaching people to build their own the machines that they use. So this is actually for farmers. I was thinking about a micro track with a spader. So a rotary spader attachment, which is a very, very useful ground preparation if you're tilling. I mean, this is not like permaculture, but it is tilling. Um, but it's a very, very useful tool. So I was thinking micro track with a PTO power takeoff. So basically a traction machine with uh, with implements that you can drag behind it. I was even looking at the at the front end loader for the pilot. Just do something super simple um, and really deliver on that. Uh, Hey, do you have any uh, updates on where you are with PowerCube work? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can. Go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I'm still kind of catching up on some stuff. I'll say first, I, I did uh, not as many hours on a lot of stuff lately, but it's given me some perspective on things. Um, some kind of report prioritizing and catching up on things, but uh, I did catch up on a lot of the videos and uh, things you had uh, recently. Mm -hmm. Um, and I did I did see the email and I reviewed some stuff for um, the, the power cube that way. I didn't see any issues with uh, links. I think all the links on the power cube are pretty good, although I need to do a lot more review on some of the uh, just back documentation stuff and 
Um, uh, let's see, I was going to say, I think the audio right now is really good. Yeah. On my end, I can hear everything. But in, yeah. in the videos, I don't know if you noticed lately, yeah. a lot of those YouTube videos, it's kind of hard to understand because it's, I don't know if it's a hardware or software issue. It's but a hardware just, issue, actually. No, it's my, a hardware issue. Yeah, my computer is like kind of like, the microphone is kind of like dying there. So, yeah, I understand oh. that. But it seems to be like, if you guys can hear me pretty well right now, I think it should be catching it decently. Good. Yeah, it, yeah, I can hear you fine. I don't, I don't hear any of that. I was thinking maybe, it, maybe it was software because it's like a clipping noise, but it seems to be consistent. So I decided yeah. it's probably hardware. And we're we're recording the the meeting too. Jen is recording that on Jitsi itself, so hopefully that's that gets a good quality thing. Yeah. If we don't forget okay. to hit yeah. uh, stop recording. <laughs> this yeah. Time, yeah. I. Uh, maybe yeah. maybe you need a USB mic or something. Sometimes those digital mics work better but that that can vary oh, that's but that's interesting that's, Maybe. Mm -hmm. what i use is a, a wireless usb headset because i guess it's because it's digital or you know it's just a, it's basically just a sound card that's in the usb you know mm -hmm. they're, they're so simple that they can do that now it's not very high quality but that doesn't matter yeah. anyway the um yeah, yeah so back to the, the power the cube. cube um I kept trying to do different stuff with the, the software and FreeCAD and all that and trying to figure out since I've been learning more Python and I, I've been spending time on that. Uh, I kept thinking I'd do micros and control the software and, and a lot of that is really just FreeCAD. You know, it's beta. It's kind of hard to work with the interface. They are improving the interfaces and I know in newer versions, I think that there is work going on, you know, on improving the interface and the way to interact and maybe some type of macro eventually other software could make it easy to control, but I just had so much trouble trying to work with kind of like wires and trying to do yeah. tubing stuff that, that, that I'd said uh, with broader perspective, that's probably less of a priority. It's kind of a subcomponent of um, getting these things to fit together on the tractor, actually. So back to that, I think, is, is uh, more the uh, first priority again. Um, so then, a little more trouble with the software and, and detailing the, the hoses on there isn't as critical as just getting everything to fit together and uh you know the hoses if they're not that's kind of hard to do in software you know it's something that can people can figure out uh we can figure out ways to estimate that more roughly and you know that that kind of gets done by hand really still i mean it comes down to actually doing that in the shop when you put the thing together but Fitting all that stuff on the tractor is still a big, a big job, just in of itself. Because, as I recall, with the the large tractor, mm -hmm. um, it looked like there need to be some some more different design changes there because uh, the, there's just so many cubes, uh, and we have to come up with some kind of method to rack it on there. So I want to get back to looking at at, at that, um, mm -hmm. and let's see. Look at that tractor again, and yeah, it sounds like um, there's a need for more implements. Like you're saying, maybe figure out what people, uh, what the locals need in that situation. Right. Maybe for low impact implements, mm -hmm. uh, a spader I guess is different than you know a tiller. Maybe that's lower impact than a than a tiller, but um, yes. yeah. sometimes I think things like like seed drills or something like that. Of course, that's yeah. Thing here practically because uh, I've seen different you know seeding equipment that way because you can sometimes they even seed directly into grass and orchards yeah. and it's effect uh, drilling the seed with you know it's usually like a rolling implement with wheels that just right. push seeds depth and all that but yeah that's the so this is pretty complicated but there might be um, some simple designs yeah cedar uh, cedar is, uh, you know, the universal cedar that's part of the Global Village construction set, isn't it? So um, that's, yeah, we can we can try that. We don't have any designs that we have actually done. Or, we don't have any prototypes of the cedar right now. We do have some experience with rotary, like rotary, the salt pulverizer and tiller. So that's more easy, just designing the blades properly and, and the proper... Uh, gearing to that just direct direct drive by strong hydraulic motors yeah um so on a, on a power cube um 
Is there any way that we can, um, like, did you give any more thought on how we validate the fit of everything? Um, or it's, let's see. it's one of those Some things, things that you really got to test it by prototyping. The distance is on everything. I've left enough room, and I think in the paracubic pit, kind of, especially the main cubic, got a lot bigger and so on. And there seems to be good distances on things, and I think even for movement and so on, it, it seems good as far as the distance between parts, as far as the plumbing, let's see, that, as far as that everything fits because of the way I've done, so let's see, that looks like a, uh, it doesn't look like, a, is that the most updated? I thought I had more, there were more plumbing parts, I don't know what version that is, but there. I clicked on it from, uh, probably I'm at, I'm at 1711, that's what I believe you... Yeah. Linked on um, the last dev team meeting well, slide. Uh, oh, you didn't maybe upload yeah. it? Oh, yeah. So you no, you actually. Yeah. Well, can you up, update that? Um, I've uploaded, but I think the last thing I uploaded was a different file. So yeah, let me link to whatever the last file was. I was experimenting with different um, possibilities for the for the drafting hoses and things, but that right. That so doesn't. You, so you're now. Good, uh, the latest now is that at GitHub right now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, still at GitHub, and I, I kind of prioritized that too. I wanted to try to reorganize the files different from that, but you know, to some degree, the problem is that if you're trying to do a history in in Git, uh, there's only a certain amount of reorganization you can do, or at least. The point, I guess, of versioning control is that you have a history, and once you've got the files, it's kind of hard to rework that after the fact, you know. So some things just, you know, have to wait for the next iteration opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But uh, let's see. So, what are your next uh, steps on, they, on the, in terms of the power cube? Um, let's see. There may need. Let's see some other parts in there. Bolts. Um, the cube itself, it, and most of the CAD on that, I was all seems pretty good. Uh, it has been for, for a while, really. Yeah. Um, any as as any I know, luck on the actual 3D scan of the any other parts? Did you 3D get, scan parts? Yeah, with um, the photogrammetry. The photogrammetry stuff. I kept doing different things on that, and it without it. And I don't have a GPU, and I know that that's part of the issue, but with speed on that, but I always found a certain amount of accuracy issues with that, and some of that could be lighting or control. Um, mm -hmm. But it it was, if you're not, some of the stuff I saw, uh, I think Alex or different people did look a little better with the drill and things, and maybe that's photo quality and so on, but um, I guess it's a question of, how much processing and editing it takes. And, and I, I did work with Mesh Labs, all the, the different software a little bit to try to see how all that worked. Mm -hmm. um, but it almost seems like it's more time consuming or just, you know, at least it's time consuming to do a lot of that stuff. If the quality isn't very good, is it easy compared to just work simple parts in FreeCAD? So yeah. I don't know which, there's a question of what sort of parts, maybe larger stuff where you don't need a lot of accuracy versus no, have you um, that way? Have you ever looked into trying to get the source files for that, for that engine? Like there, somebody's um, got to have the source files. Yeah, I mean, from from the photos and everything, I decided when I reworked that engine that it, it's got to be pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, although at this point, but yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, it could be be better, but. Um, hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know it's source files for the engine. I, online, they don't seem to have a lot of manuals. Those companies, they, they change things quite a bit, you know, with yeah. engine designs even and so on. So, you know, that we've never found a lot of published information or details on that. This looks like a trip to China. I'll see what I can do. I'm actually going. <laughs> I'm going to meet David yeah. Lee next week, actually, to speak in Hong Kong. Actually, so I'm going to start asking like. How do you actually find? Because uh, because that stuff is actually all all available there. They they do share that. If you're from the outside, you can't really 
get it, you have to be in, you have to know how to get in there, but they're not on to get on wheat. sharing the files. I, I hear that their just-in-time manufacturing is very much based around the Chinese WeChat. All those manufacturers constantly share information on WeChat, and they can put out stuff faster than you can patent it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, where'd you, you read that? Uh, uh, yeah, the Good bit of articles on that kind of stuff. The yeah, just-in-time yeah. manufacturing, they're, they're fast at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, we got to, hopefully uh, I'll get some insight into that next week. But yeah, yeah, it's actually, it's this China trip, uh, I might, if I like it, I might be going back there and really like, because uh, basically what David Lee told me is that if it exists on Alibaba, then you can get the blueprints for it if you know where to look. So that's yeah. that could be an interesting way to actually... Uh, get some of the components, like blueprints for various components that we just don't have a clue like how they're designed right now. Especially if we could find the engineers that are responsible for those plans. So it's it's an actually very interesting proposition. I have to look yeah, into I listened that more. to some of that video uh, with with David. Although it was sometimes it's kind of hard to hear, but the it, it is interesting in how open source. A lot of times we. People worry about you know open to even open sourcing because they, they'll copy it for high speed manufacturing and and I noticed that, that some news too that the Chinese are moving a lot of manufacturing almost from yeah. investing in Africa. Oh yeah, a lot of yeah, yeah. stuff moving China to there. It's kind of you know moving around the way it does the low cost. Um, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's so, absolutely real according to David. Yep. Open sourcing. Um, even smaller simpler parts, even if we can't manufacture them, I mean, how you know that kind of there's you know a lot of questions. We could debate that endlessly, I'm sure about. You know, if they use open source stuff and they're moving that way, and the Chinese, mm, there's been complaints, of course, about with like 3D printers, I know, and software, and them not respecting open source, different, you know, legal stuff. But um, you know, open sourcing things and then they're being manufactured that way and getting uh, manufacturers to open source even open source stuff even though they're mass producing it as opposed to local production. It's you know, there's pros and cons. It's still it's basically a bad thing if people start open sourcing parts because even if they mass produce it cheap, people people can still produce it locally when they want yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I mean just open source is a cool idea just in general. Yep. Yeah, yeah just a lot of that people access. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of drawing lots of stuff in CAD, you know, and things like that, and doing all the yeah. research. But uh, yeah, it sounded like he was talking about electric motors and things like that a lot too. But yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah, yeah sounds good. Um, let's see. Can we focus? Maybe the. Let's see. One side is. I don't know. Is um, have you fit? maybe try fitting the new power cube into the old version of the micro track so you make sure everything fits in there um maybe oh. do that as the next uh, step because we got the full micro track file pretty much I, I had that email the other day i should cover that i looked to see if there were any issues with the links there but i think that there were some questions as to the version of that maybe i don't know if there's any confusion the version my understanding was back the versions were 1708, there was a power cube 1708, and that corresponded, I think, with the uh, 1708 CEB press. Yeah. Last year. And then, right. and then um, what was it? Yeah. So, And then there was a 1710 power cube, and I believe that was a slight redesign for the micro track. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh, yeah. So, this large cube for... The larger tractor, I don't know that, it, I think it's much larger, so I don't know that it would fit on the, um, the micro track. Um, I, I'm not, oh. yeah, I'm not sure how they it would okay. fit. I think it's quite a bit bigger. Okay, well, because we need one. Um, right, so I'm going to make a note in PowerCube Genealogy that we built, uh, built for the C, so 1708 was built, yeah, I'm losing track of that, built for the CEB press in Utah. And I think that's what um, that they were saying, that, uh, the Saudis and, and maybe a building, was it a built in Africa too? Mm -hmm. uh, about other stuff maybe there with the tractor, but the, 
the Vico Trek and whatever else. They, they sounded like they were building CB. They wanted to build CB presses and uh, maybe other things there. So I don't know if 1708 is the, you know, the right version. They should use an older version. Technically, it shouldn't be too hard to edit. If people want to, especially if they want to do a CNC cut, because the 1711 and 8201 versions are similar, and they're, they're designed to be more easily cut out of steel. I mean, that was kind of the point to yeah. cut them on the twist table. They could probably be edited, you know, if that's uh, the route that they want to go and, and changed a little bit. Uh, or, you know, I mean, of course, the advantage of this larger the cube with lots of uh, hookups is technically that you could just build that and just cap off the stuff you don't need. That way it's it's not that much more cost, right? Just to add, add a few more pipes into the um, thing and then, and then, you know, if people need to use it modularly in the future uh, for other things, they have that option. I mean, I would probably want to go that way. You know, it seems like a good way to do it. Just build um, version that's more usable for a variety of things yeah. but you know if they want to simplify it they can always take out um you know extra stuff it's pretty easy to edit out the extra pipes and so on mm -hmm. yeah and just reduce if you need to reduce and um or that could be made much smaller oh the other i guess version difference on some of these two was there were changes at different points and I had different issues with the uh, the pumps, which is the major right. the major difference between you know, the hooking the two. Uh, I think you were using the like a, a large a two stage pump. You were testing for the CB press maybe right. originally. Yeah. And I think that didn't work out as well or something. Right. I, I don't remember the details there, but yeah. Um, so I I think that those files were edited and everything should be uh, hopefully pretty clear on what the pump is because that's the main difference too and depending on what the what kind of pump they can source locally i guess is an issue too with right the um the yeah room. for the for the power cube would you mind like uh putting a part do we have a part library for the power cube are you doing that yeah the, let's see there's... which which version is that and... is that uh, the latest one I mean, part of the, I put all the files that we're using that, of course, on, on GitHub. Let me check that. Would that be 1801? 1801 is the cube without the Oh, yeah, PowerCube library. We already have that. Okay, there it is. Um, final assembly modules. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Um, yeah, can you keep sp splitting that into little parts? Because actually what would be useful... Um, so making small 3D prints of the individual components would be useful in that we can compare the 3D print to the actual model to see if there's any discrepancies. Like when we... I mean, in fact, for workshops, like if we do a workshop, having the model where you can actually put the pieces together just as little 3D prints and you actually could see this, okay, you can put the engine in, you can put like the pump and other components. That would be useful for 3D printing actually. So yeah, can you continue like breaking that down into individual parts so we can, um, we can do that? Okay, there's the PowerCube library, yeah. which is yep. the general stuff. Yeah, yeah it, there's more parts through there and there should be there should be a power cube part library too. Looking for the link to that one. Um, they should have more of the, the small parts. Yeah, I um, remember that. Where? What is the name of that? I guess is the question. Let's see, power seventeen. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it would be nice to like you know thinking about larger development teams like doing maybe design sprints where or a design jam where some people are printing the actual uh, scale parts using a large nozzle. So it's actually a very quick print. And then we're assembling and fitting things together in real time to see how they fit before the actual build. Because I think the closest right now that we have to vetting the actual design before we, we actually build it is 3D printing, I would say. Because you can even do things like print the hoses and fittings so that you can see where um, things get tight angles or whatever. Um, 
but that does re rely on accurate CAD, and ac and, but we can validate the CAD from the actual prints, because if the print looks like the real thing, that means we're like close and, and so forth. So it would be nice to add that in our overall process as we go forward. So that would be good. Yeah, that's um, a little more physical hands-on. Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. Just look at the CAD, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, well that sounds good. So yeah, keep going on. Yeah, I mean, see if you can uh, organize the library parts so we can possibly do that. Because actually, you know, that might be quite relevant. Um, those little scale models might be relevant if we're trying to put like five power cubes onto the big tractor, which I'd like to see happen pretty soon. Like, uh, ideally, if things were to go decently next year, we, we have the torch table kicking out parts and doing the big tractor build uh, ideally next year. We'll see if we can get there. I'm not, I'm not sure if we're going to be able to get there, but definitely the torch table as a start. So, okay, let's keep moving on here. Um, Herman, do you have anything to, to report on or any, any comments? Are you talking to me? No, uh, to Hagerman, who's um, not Jen. Um, Hello, Martin. Yeah. I no, no. I have uh, to this point nothing, nothing, nothing new from this side. Yeah. From this. Uh, side, yeah. Are you in touch with the Germany people? Where, um, like for example, Ruslan has your three D printer, correct? Still. Yes, that is yeah. correct. Are they moving forward on um, on their power cube? Not the power cube, the the their twenty twenty aluminum frame three D printer. Do you know? The one working on that, I think, is Oliver. Yeah. And uh, I heard him talking every now and then, making making comments. Uh, but I don't think he's is very. Um, uh, he works in, in a lot of uh, things all together. I think he he, um, yeah. he doesn't really keep keep a uh, day to day uh, record of all the projects that he has going on. Um, yeah. Right. I uh, I am participating in, in a couple of the groups that that uh, they have here in Telegram. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of traffic there mainly related to solar solar power. Yeah, uh, yeah. Are they moving yeah. forward with their their open sol solar? So the their little power station, solar kind of like the solar power cube thing. That's yes. Moving forward. Yes. Uh, do Do they have a product release date or anything like that? Do you know? No, no, I am not aware. Uh, not yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Well, um, I am. Uh, there's a branch uh, of open source ecology. Uh, another branch. Uh, um, uh, a couple of people that meet in a hobby, hobby, uh, in some sort of uh, fab lab here in um, Stuttgart, mm -hmm. which is relatively close from where I am. Yeah. Um, my aim is to, to see if I, in a couple of months I managed to um, go there and, and have a look. Yeah. Yep. Okay. That sounds good. So, sounds good. Um, yeah, so let's, let's start wrapping up here. So to wrap up, uh, I do keep talking about the design sprints and getting more people involved, but one, I think one avenue that we're seeing emerging is that uh, if we create curriculum for teachers, then we can have teachers, we teach them about basics of 3D printing as well as uh, so prototyping and, and basic design and part libraries so that we can host like host clubs where certain teachers, there will likely be certain teachers that actually adopt uh, the greater mission of OSC and say, hey, yeah, we also want to get involved in prototyping, so starting clubs, things like that. So once we have that in multiple locations, I think that can kind of go together with this training of the teachers, because we can maybe add like another day to training of teachers and curriculum development. Like we recently talked to Digital Promise, which creates curriculum for, uh, for schools. But it would be an interesting route if we could provide curriculum to schools and then we get people, students and teachers who are actually behind 
doing continuing development efforts so we can we can grow the team that way there's possibilities there um, but once again it's uh, takes time to develop that so but we look forward to that as as we roll out the 3d printers and other micro factory parts so anyway I think uh, let's wrap up here so we're you know we're busy on, on 3d printer work marketing uh, developing other things in the background uh, the potential Africa pilot and looking for a more immersion experience next April May so that's about all for now so yeah let's let's reconvene next week then so same time Tuesday uh, well no 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 hold on hold on I'm actually gonna be uh, not gonna be there so because uh, I'm actually leaving for Hong Kong on the 22nd so I think next meeting we'll we'll take it from here on the 30th the Tuesday um, and I'll report on the findings from Shenzhen China <laughs> see if they're gonna let me across the border uh, but yeah so so no meeting next week um, go on traveling and then let's reconvene on 30th of October and see where we are and that's actually gonna be uh, after both after the uh, Hong Kong trip speaking at it's called the Chinese University of Hong Kong and then the first events coming up on the 27th in, in Oakland at Counterculture Labs so if anyone wants to sign up, please see, see the website. But we'll report on the progress of these events um, in our meeting on Tuesday the 30th. So thanks a lot, everybody. We'll talk to you soon. And Jen, uh, hit the stop record so we can post this if uh, maybe you got a better copy. So thanks, everybody. We'll talk, talk uh, in two weeks. Bye -bye. Thanks, Gretchen.